we continue our service with a confession and declaration of grace. We join to make confession of our sins. O oh, Almighty, Almighty God, God merciful, merciful Father, Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Is this your confession? Yes. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 62, verses 1 through 5. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, 
I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is Psalm 128. We will read it responsively. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish, to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually, individually as he wills. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the Holy Gospel. Jesus' miracle at the wedding of Cana. The Holy Gospel according to John, the second chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. 
When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rite of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to thee, O Christ. Good morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text for today is taken from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, where Jesus says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. When I was around 18 years old, I read a book that made a lasting impression on me. Perhaps some of you may have read it. 
Magnificent Obsession. It was written in the late 1920s by Lloyd C. Douglas and became a bestseller. It was also made into a movie twice, the last version starring Jane Wyman and Rock Hudson, which is sometimes shown occasionally on Turner classic movies. Douglas was ordained a Lutheran minister after graduating from Wittenberg University in Springfield, Ohio. Later in his ministry, he became the 13th minister of the First Congregational Church in Akron. After retiring from the pulpit in 1926, Douglas decided to write. Magnificent Obsession was his first novel. Among his other works are The Big Fisherman and The Robe, which were also made into movies. When Douglas sent his manuscript for Magnificent Obsession to his publishers, they didn't know whether to classify it as a religious book or a love story, since it had both religious and love story themes. It was the religious message that caught my attention and the attention of many other readers, because it set forth a prescription for living that when practice produces positive results. Douglas never disclosed what biblical text he used to develop his religious theme, but I deduce for myself that it was from Matthew 6, our text for today. I think most of you are familiar with that passage. Putting the text aside for the moment, let's get into the story. Robert Merrick is the character in the book, the main character in the book. Merrick, who is a playboy of sorts, is out on a lake in a speedboat when he suffers a boating accident. An emergency crew is sent to the scene to resuscitate him using the only resuscitator available in the area. Meanwhile, on the other side of the lake, one Dr. Hudson suffers a heart attack in the presence of his young wife, and he dies. Dr. Hudson was the head of the hospital that serviced the town. He was well known for his kindness and for helping people. Merrick, it turns out, was on the board of directors of the hospital. When Merrick learns how his life was spared, and that except for the use of the resuscitator to save him, the doctor may have been saved. He is devastated. Later, while going through records in the hospital, Merrick learns that the hospital has many copies of paid bills from patients who were treated by Dr. Hudson. He also comes across a journal written by Dr. Hudson in code, and he sets out to decipher it. During this time, one by one, certain of Dr. Husson's patients return to the hospital, offering to pay their bills. This seems, seems strange to Merrick, and he takes note of it. These patients all tell a similar story. When they were injured or became ill and could not afford a doctor, Dr. Hudson listened to their plight and offered to treat them free of charge under certain conditions. First, that they promised not to tell anyone. And second, that he did not want to be repaid. When some of them eventually got on their feet, they returned to the hospital and tried to pay Dr. Hudson. But he refused. Each time he tells them, I can't accept the money because it hasn't been used up yet. When Merrick decodes the journal, and after talking to all of the people that Dr. Hudson helped, he becomes obsessed. He decides to reevaluate his life and go to medical school. It becomes a magnificent obsession. Merrick becomes a brain surgeon. He returns to the hospital and rises to the position of head doctor. He too decides to help patients, employing the same conditions of Dr. Hudson, that they not tell anybody, 
As these patients heal, Merrick grows as a person and also in confidence as a surgeon. Along the way, he falls in love with doc the doctor's widow, who after an accident becomes blind. Merrick is unsure if he is, has the strength to operate on her so she can regain her sight. Yet he knows deep down he is the only surgeon who can perform the operation. Merrick is not the same person he was when he crashed his boat on the lake. Over the years, he has done some good works, similar to Dr. Hudson, and under the same conditions that his patients not tell anybody. He understands the secret contained in Dr. Hudson's journal, that when you sound the trumpet about yourself, you are trying to ingratiate yourself with others, to reap the rewards of men, to climb the social ladder of success. On the other hand, if you do your good works in secret, you alone know what you do, and you alone can watch the results of your work. As you watch these good works grow, the money is continually in use. It is not yet used up. It is an investment and still growing, an investment in people. Merrick starts to gain confidence, performs the operation, Mrs. Hudson's sight is restored, and there is a Hollywood ending. They get married and they live happily ever after. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul says, For it is grace you have been saved, through faith and not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, that no one can boast. Again, in Romans 3.28, Paul says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith, apart from observing the law. The main article of the Augsburg Confession is concerned with justification by faith, that we are justified by faith, not of works, lest any man can boast. What does Paul mean when he says a man is justified? What is justification? In criminal law, there is the established concept of justifiable homicide. That is, a killing that is forgiven because it is justified. In such a case, there is no sentence, even though someone has been killed. In contrast, justification in spiritual terms is the forgiveness of sin through God's mercy. Similar to justifiable homicide, there is no sentence. Simply stated, justification means being cleared of wrongdoing, all wrongdoing. That is, sinning against God. Again, there is no sentence. How are we cleared? from sinning against God. The first point is that we are cleared of wrongdoing through God's grace, gratis. It is a gift. We did not earn it. We did not deserve it. We are sinners. The second point is that we realize this gift through faith. Christ died for all, but not all believe. Those who do not believe do not realize the gift of God's grace. Thus it is through belief, faith in Jesus, that we receive forgiveness. There is also an article in the Confession concerning good works. Good works follow as one grows in faith. These works are not performed to get the big payoff. We can't earn our way to heaven. Our works follow because of who we are, who we become because of faith, and who we become grows over time. Through faith, we take on a new type of obedience in keeping the law. We become obedient to the law to please the Lord, but we also know 
we fall short. Our new obedience is not to chalk up points, but rather to try and replicate the life of Jesus. And when we fall short, through faith in him, we are forgiven. Through faith in Jesus Christ and God's mercy, we take on a new character. And just like Robert Merrick, we become a new person. This new obedience pleases God because it is for the right reason, that is, serving God by loving him and loving our neighbor. In this manner, our good works are done to please God, not to pay a debt for our sin, because that debt has already been paid by someone else, Jesus Christ. We do good works because we want to please God and obey him, not to pay for something wrong that we did, because Christ has already paid that price. Having been ordained a Lutheran minister, surely Lloyd Douglas was aware of the Augsburg Confession. Perhaps that is why he chose not to use a biblical citing in his text. Yet his message was inspiring to a lot of people. Some ethicists say that a moral act must be a disinterested one, one detached from one's own personal benefit or self-interest. If we volunteer at the local homeless shelter and brag about it, it takes away from the moral virtue of it. The good works that are freely given, however, as we grow in faith, acquire genuine moral significance. I kind of associate blowing the trumpet about one's accomplishments with bragging. At a young age, I was taught not to brag when playing sports. Vince Lombardi is quoted as have saying, when you get into the end zone, don't act like you've never been there before. We have people in this church who give anonymously. A few years ago, an anonymous donor paid for our fireplace installed in the fellowship hall. Last December, we received a large donation of stock from an anonymous donor. It sold for more than $30,000. We are putting in an electric sign in front of the church largely because of the generosity of an anonymous donor. I don't know if any of these members ever read Magnificent Obsession or that they saw the movie, but I'm sure they are familiar with our text for today. Regardless of their motivation, we can all do well by practicing what the Lord said. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your father, who sees what you have done in secret, will reward you. Amen. Rise as you are able. We continue with the service with reciting the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in, God. in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus 
and for all people according to their needs. In an uncertain world, we pray for all who, who represent us in the various levels of government, from our local communities to national offices during these very trying times. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all who work in the medical and emergency as they serve and care for those who suffer from COVID. We pray for their safety and health and thankfulness to our community. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick or suffering physical ailments. Today, we add the name of Nancy and Van Skyke. We'll be in there. We also pray for Pastor Jim and Cindy for Linda, Keith, Karen Kunz's husband, Karen Kunz, Lynn Randall DeGar, Tom Harmon, Ruth Ashey, Bill, Chris, Kat, and Aldra. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those suffering with long-term ailments. Anna Mildenberger, Chuck Kopp, Pat Rowe, Betty Keeney, Mark, Ruth Decker, Sandy Richter, Donna Kopp, Mary, Carol Chisholm, Sherry Taylor, Peter, Nadine Culver, Lewis Powell, and Sarah, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray that you would keep those serving in the military community. We especially pray for those affiliated with our church. Phil, Colin, Dash, John, Corey, Kyle, Scott, Tori, Matt, Ryan, Noah, Joseph, Faustine, Joshua, and Mason. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the homebound. Hildy Nay, Ruth Ashey, Bill, and Lois Yeager. Be with them and send them visitors. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. This week we are very thankful to have many birthdays upcoming in our congregation. We pray for special blessings for Alexander Disk, Noah Green, Brenda Hughes, Annalise Ney, Kaylee Schmidt, Christian Disk, John, Don Galloway, Larry Anders, Anna Mildenberger, Jim Phillips. Be with them and grant them another year of service and grant them great blessings during this week. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We also have a wedding anniversary this week. Uh, Pastor Jim and Cindy will be celebrating their 39th anniversary this week. We pray that you would continue to bless them and be uh, as they not only celebrate another year of marriage, but also as they uh, start their retirement. Lord, mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray our Lord's Prayer together. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his shine, face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. The closing hymn will be the church's one foundation, number 644.